this is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tolohungba. A police officer in Canada is off work after he allegedly shot and killed an Indigenous woman. 26-year-old Chantelle Moore, a Cloquiet First Nation woman, was killed during a wellness check. Her former boyfriend called police at 2.30 Thursday morning. According to the CBC News, Moore had just moved to New Brunswick, and her friend was concerned because she told him she was being harassed. When police arrived, they said she came out of her apartment with a knife and threatened them. Grace Frank, the woman's grandmother, posted on Facebook saying, quote, I don't believe this. They were going there to check on her, not kill her. This comes after more than a week of intense protests over the killing of George Floyd while in the custody of Minneapolis police. According to the Canadian police report, the officer did not attempt to use non-lethal force before shooting her. The police there do not use body cameras. An external investigation is now underway. COVID-19 cases are on the rise in the Osage Nation in Oklahoma. The six new cases are all employees of the tribe. They were identified at the Wajaji Health Center this week. Employees in close contact with the six were told to immediately quarantine. Close contact is defined as 10 minutes or more within six feet of an infected person. Those with less contact are at low risk and do not need to test or isolate, but should monitor for symptoms. At least one employee attended a funeral and an outdoor election event the day before testing positive. That's prompted the Osage Nation to work with the state on contact tracing. And a second closure is in effect today on the Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation in Arizona, also due to a spike in COVID-19 cases there. The temporary closure of the nation's tribal government operations and services does not apply to essential personnel and services. The tribe is urging everyone to stay at home to stop the spread of the virus. Non-residents are not allowed to stay overnight at this time. Food sales and vendor lots are also being closed. Tribal members are being encouraged to follow CDC guidelines. The closure is in effect through June 19th. Gatherings during this time will be limited to 25 people for, for religious purposes and for funerals. And now for the latest numbers of COVID positive tests in Indian country, let's go to our Washington editor, Jordan Bennett Begay. We have updates of COVID-19 cases and deaths from five tribes across the country. And here are the latest numbers from our database. There are 8,397 positive confirmed cases and 329 deaths in the Indian health system. Again, that is a total of 8,397 positive confirmed cases and 329 deaths as of June 5th. In New Mexico, the Mescalero Apache tribe reported one new positive case on its reservation. The tribe has 11 cases in total now. 10 cases are residents on the reservation and one case is off the reservation. The Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians in Mississippi reported 19 more cases. This brings the total to 698 for the tribe and 35 deaths in total. The White Mountain Apache tribe in Arizona announced 48 new cases. This gives the tribe a total of 885 cases and nine deaths. And also in Arizona, the Colorado River Indian tribes saw a spike in new cases since we logged them in our database a few weeks ago too. The tribe reported 14 new cases within the last 24 hours, giving them a total of 96 cases. On May 19th, they had 22 cases in total. Tribal officials are urging individuals to limit contact outside of their households and to wear face masks if they leave their house for essential items. In the Navajo Nation that spans in Arizona, uh, spans across Arizona and in parts of New Mexico announced 69 new cases and five additional deaths. Tribal officials say they have a total of 5,730 cases and 264 deaths and 2,174 individuals who have recovered from COVID-19. And now this weekend, the tribe is pausing the 57 week in lockdown starting this weekend, but the uh, seven day nightly curfew from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. is still in place, Patty. All right, so we have a, a spike and we're seeing this as uh, states are starting to reopen and people are venturing back outside. So a number of tribes seen a spike uh, and possibly this could indicate the second wave. Yes, it could, especially for uh, the Colorado River Indians tribe in Arizona, too. All right, Jordan Benabigay, thank you. Thank you, And we'll be right back.
this is Indian Country Today. Welcome back. For months now, the global pandemic has dominated the news cycle, and now the country is facing the biggest wave of civil rights protests ever. Join, joining us today on our Reporters Roundtable are two journalists who have been covering these stories. Dana Hedgepeth is a reporter with the Washington Post. She joined the Post in 1999 and has covered breaking news in the, D, in the DC metro area, um, as well as courts, military spending, commercial real estate, to name just a few areas. Welcome, Dana. Thank you for having me. Also joining us is Julian Brave Noisecat. He wears many hats, including being a writer. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Paris Review, and in our own Indian country today, um, as well as many other news outlets. Welcome, Julian. Thanks so much for having me. Your most recent article, Julian, uh, ha had the title, you know, How to Survive an Apocalypse and Keep Dreaming. And there was a line in there that talked about uh, Native Americans um, having inherited this audacious vision. What did you mean by that? So this week I published a story in The Nation. It was part of a series that they were running called Think Big. Uh, and it was a bunch of writers and thinkers uh, and a few policy wonks talking about what they thought the world uh, in the most utopian vision that they had could look like after this pandemic. Uh, and so I thought about uh, the experience of um, our people, of indigenous people, um, as people who have survived apocalypses before uh, and wrote about what I thought the sort of um, perspective and insights that we have developed as a community are that might sort of be relevant to a broader humanity that is coming out of um, this coronavirus pandemic. And that's, um, it, it's, it had that feeling of hope, you know, that, you know, what can the greater country learn from Native Americans? And when you talk about uh, the apocalypse that we've survived, you know, certainly just uh, colonialism, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the apocalypse is, um, is colonialism. It's, it's the apocalypse of the loss of, of our land, the loss of, uh, you know, so much life. Um, and you know it, it's it's sort of the enduring legacies of that in many of the injustices and inequities that our communities face today whether that be the really grisly phenomenon of native women going missing and murdered uh or you know the the way in which this pandemic um by statistical measures has actually uh disproportionately impacted uh native communities you know the most the most impacted areas of this country are in fact uh, our reservations. And you know you can't understand those current circumstances without understanding the, the deeper history that led to them. On the other hand though, I think that um, you know, there is a, a very powerful history of resilience, um, of, of political struggle, um, and of artistic creation coming out of those same uh, very circumstances of tragedy. And I think that that sort of notion, the notion that there can be beauty after tragedy was was kind of what I was trying to suggest with the essay I wrote. And I think that's a, that's a, a big lesson because so many people, you know, there's so much in the moment now of like, oh, we can't go out, we can't do this. You know, we've seen protests uh, before the uh, civil rights protests that we're seeing now of people wanting to reopen because they wanted a haircut. And when you put that against what Native Americans have gone through, uh, it almost seems, well, what does it seem to you? Um, you know, it seems to lack a sort of broader perspective and, and a broader sense of compassion, right? Like the reason that we need to remain socially distant is that we need to care about our neighbors. Um, and, you know, not just in a sort of observing the news sense, but if you look at a lot of the um, a lot of the survey data sense people are increasingly wary of the of the folks who live in their own community are increasingly wary of of the folks who live next door to them and you know we're sort of losing as a country and as a as a planet really uh, that sense of human community um, and I think that you know I mean when I go back home or when I spend time with my family I think that we do still have that we haven't lost that sort of sense of kinship and connection and community where you go over to your family or friend's house and there's food and you take care of each other and you know we spend time together and we play games and we do all that sort of stuff and 
um, I think that it's really beautiful that as Native people, we have maintained that sort of sense of family and community in a world where many people are losing that, losing that one of the things that I think in, in a broad sense makes us, makes us human. Right, our social structures are you know, overly social uh, with our clanship, you know, and it's not just your immediate family, but that whole clan, that idea of a village and really coming together. And unfortunately though, in this pandemic, that's also going against us. Uh, and, and we talk about the, um, the, the history of, um, of our people and treaties that were put in place that have not been fulfilled. So from that, you know, we see overcrowding in housing and, um, and you actually wrote another story about housing, not so much within the Afri or within the Native American community, but with the African American community. Um, yeah, I mean, so I think that the 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 the, the situation of you know people living in overcrowded circumstances is you know not something that usually is is a choice, but is an economic sort of circumstance that is pushed upon people. Um, you know, on in the reservation context, it's because we have grossly underfunded Indian housing block grants for over 20 years. Um, you know, similarly in, in urban centers, it's because the rent is insanely high. I live in Washington, D.C., and I spend an enormous fraction of my income on rent. Um, and what that ends up happening is that people end up crowding into uh, the housing that is available to them and they bring in their, you know, their brothers, their sisters, their girlfriend, their cousin. Um, and, you know, in the circumstances of a pandemic, that, is, that can be a really dangerous uh, way, to be, way to be living. So I think that um, in many ways, I think this pandemic has just revealed the, um, the way in which so many people in the United States were already living on the edge. And all it took was, you know, a, a very novel zoonotic virus to come around and it pushed many, many people off the edge. And that is the circumstance that we're facing right now. Well, um, thank you. Dana, let me turn to you. And um, uh, in your reporting, some of what Julian's talking about came out in, in one of your stories when you looked at uh, Indian country on a national level and what different tribes were doing uh, when they came up against this pandemic. That's right. As Julian has pointed out in his reporting, has said here today, these sadly are not issues that are new to Native Americans, they have existed in Indian country and it's not all of a sudden. I think what's so interesting um, is that this virus has hit, it has left no man, woman, child untouched, right? This has impacted everyone's lives. And for some, we could spend time judging people's inconveniences, right? Is a haircut essential service or not? But the bottom line is the native community has been dealing with so many of these issues already of overcrowding health issues. Um, tribes have been dealing with those struggles as best they can, often with limited funds, um, and then to be hit with a tsunami of sorts, is what I would say this virus has been, has just been incredibly hard to manage. You're dealing with very basic things, food. We all need food. Um, getting that food to people is a logistical challenge. Patty, you know this better than anyone. Um, not easy locations to get food to. Just because you drop off at one point doesn't mean that it necessarily gets to a village or a smaller part of a tribe. It is a logistics uh, nightmare. Um, so I think it has been really interesting to watch how people who are volunteers have tried their best. And even then, it's hard. And are their failures short? They're trying uh, very much. But I don't think mainstream folks have really gotten that Native Americans, we have tribes that are still dealing with the basics of running water. The message from the CDC has been over and over again, wash your hands, wash your hands. I also live in Washington, not far from Julian. We both pay high housing costs, but we have water. We can wash our hands frequently. Um, I don't mean to demean, but this is such a simple thing for so many of us in many communities, yet there's a huge gap of so many Native Americans who don't have that. And when you're telling people over and over to wash your hands, it does leave people to almost put their hands up and say, I, I can't wash my hands, much less social distance when I'm crowding, I'm taking care of grandkids, I'm taking care of an, an, an uncle. Um, I've asked people, uh, it's very easy, I think, for health officials to say, you know, quarantine yourself. But I know even in my own house, I've asked my husband, if one of us gets sick, knock on wood, where would we go? And this is our home. And then when you share your home with others, it's in our culture, it would never 
kick grandma and grandpa out or aunt and uncle or someone, you know, you take care of people, especially when they're sick. So I think it's, it's hitting on so many points. It's, it's very hard points. Uh, um, there really is no place to go. I mean, even in Washington, there's been times during this pandemic where hotels have been closed. They don't want to expose their workers. It's not, even if I had money, which I did, a check into a hotel, wouldn't be able to. So you're hitting on all these points, the logistics, the physical, the mental. Uh, it, it is quite a conundrum, but some of these issues, I feel like have been long around for Indian country. What's interesting is that mainstream has all of a sudden gone, wow. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'll throw the question back to Julian of, these aren't new things to us, um, but when you have a disease that has hit the world um, and then people focusing on Indian country, they have this sort of shock and surprise. Um, whereas all of us of the circle have heard of these issues for years and it's like, you wanna say, this is what we've been telling you. Um, folks have been dealing with this for a while and then all of a sudden it's to shine this big light for everyone. I, I hope it can in the long term be change, maybe faster. Uh, then you have all the civil unrest. It's throwing this unbelievable mix of things. It's like a cake and it's all being mixed together in sort of unprecedented times. Well, you, you, <clears throat> you touched on that, uh, that idea that, you know, both of you reach a large non-native uh, readership. Uh, people who are new to Indian country and learning through your reporting about what's going on. So you mentioned a few reactions, Dana. What about you, Julian? What kind of reaction has your writing stirred with your with people who are reading maybe for the first time about Indian country? Well, I, I'll say that I, I get most of my reader reactions at this point through Twitter, uh, which is maybe not the best filter for, for commentary criticism because it ends up being primarily um, my experience, at least, is it ends up primarily being other journalists and other people in the industry who are responding to your work. And like, on the one hand, I want my colleagues to read my stuff and think that it's good. On the other hand, like, I shouldn't be writing for other journalists and media types. Um, but what, what Dana was also just saying about, uh, you know, there's sort of this discovery again of, of Native people that just happened. Uh, it really reminds me of uh, this this piece that Vine Deloria Jr. wrote um, like back in the 70s where he described this sort of constant rediscovery of Native people who kind of like jump out of the side of the scene in American history and then sort of disappear as like the cameo theory of history, I think was the way that he phrased it. Um, and I feel like that sort of notion that we kind of like pop up in this moment, you know, like... Um, I love Nick Kristof's column in, in uh, the New York Times the other week that, that talked about how Indian country is disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus. On the other hand, it's like we pop into a New York Times column once every couple months and then we're, you know, we disappear again. Um, and so I, I, it leads me to wonder, like, you know, what would it look like to have a, a media industry that covered these issues in such a way that they didn't just sort of pop up on the radar and disappear again, pop up on the radar and disappear again, right? Like, what would it look like to have sustained coverage where people weren't, would understand the underlying issues and therefore wouldn't be like, oh my God, why are, you know, places that have the population density of Siberia, more or less, you know, some of the hottest hotspots for the coronavirus in the world. Um, and so I think that there's a real failing of, of journalism, which is in, in, a, in a hard spot, obviously, right now. Um, to have sustained attention on our communities and our people. Well, it, it's, uh, it is um, kind of frustrating to, as you said, you know, come up once in a while. And um, so, you know, that's the effort and work of Indian Country Today to really try to bring these stories to light. And we're seeing, we're seeing other journalists come in and follow us and, and use our same sources. So it's okay, I guess it's okay. <laughs> But, um, but in the middle of all of this, <clears throat> we have a global pandemic. I mean, a, 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 the global pandemic and then also the, uh, the uh, uh, civil rights protests that are going on across the country. And, um, you know, well, on one hand, you know, you see all these people marching out there. And on the other hand, you're saying, but, you know, very few are, are social distancing. You know, nobody's social distancing, let's just say that. And no one's, you know, people just aren't wearing a fa uh, face covering. And so, you know, there's a concern there about 
a spike in, in the coronavirus cases coming out of all of these protests. And um, uh, so, so talk about that, Dana, because you know, in DC, there, you've had a lot of protests there. And um, are we seeing Native people being a part of that too? We are seeing some Native people. And as Julian said, unfortunately, we do tend to pop up. Um, people check in on minorities when sadly disasters hit them the hardest and then leave. Uh, can hope for better consistency and at least they're going to sources like Indian country because you have been consistently there and thank you. The Post recently published, uh, I believe it went up late last night or early this morning, in fact, the column called Voices um, about those who are participating. And it was it, some audio and some written where people were able to write in across the country of their experiences. And there was a woman from Minneapolis um, and she's native and she has long been involved in some parts there. And she said, this, she wasn't at first going to get involved, but this time she did because it's her hometown. It's, it's, she's, you know, very concerned about her community. And the picture that she sent in, um, or someone took of her, I believe, is of her with devastation in, in Minneapolis. Um, and it was just, it was nice to see, there was probably ha a dozen folks, uh, but I sort of cheered when I read it about 2 a.m. this morning of, hey, at least they did have a native voice. One is never enough, but one of 12 when you're polling the country and she got picked, it was pretty powerful. Um, and again, one is never enough, but at least not totally forgotten. Um, you're absolutely right. Social distancing and protesting. Uh, we, we see pictures of people arm in arm and every time I sort of cringe because my daily job is to keep up the numbers of our local tracker of how many cases. And I can tell you they're improving slightly. I want to stress that word. Uh, nowhere near enough of what the health authorities want to see and they're warning that in a week or two, when symptoms typically show up for folks, we could see another spike. Our mayor this morning said she's putting on hold. We're only in phase one here in Washington, DC. We have yet to move to phase two. My tribe in North Carolina is already on phase two. So it's, it's very different, very individual to each community. But one of the things she's watching is what will be the impact of these protests. Um, we're blessed to live in a country where we have freedom of speech, our First Amendment rights. I absolutely fully support that. But at the same time, I do tell you that my heart cringes a bit of getting back to even semi-normal is all going to depend on what these numbers. Um, and the mayor here has been very consistent of saying that. She really believes in the science. She's only going to open, she has indicated when those numbers are okay. So uh, I, my job is checking those numbers daily. I'm very familiar with them. Um, we're all yeah. sort of on the pins and needles of waiting to see what will the impact be. The good news is the protests are outside, but again, when uh, 188 people get arrested in a night, a jail is not known for social distancing, even in normal times are being spread out. You're packing those folks together, which is completely the opposite, right, of what we've all been hearing from health officials. That's, wor that's worrisome. It is. Go ahead, Julianne. Oh, I, I wasn't going to say, I was going to, I'll just jump in and say that I think that it's really encouraging that despite the circumstances of a pandemic, uh, that people are willing to, you know, risk their own health to go stand in solidarity with the Black community against something that is obviously wrong, which is police killing people and specifically killing a lot of Black people. Um, and, you know, it, not with my journalist hat on, although I was tweeting a little bit, um, I went down to you know, Lafayette Square Park the other day um, with my citizen hat on. And I think it is, it's really encouraging that, that uh, despite the circumstances of the pandemic, that so many people are, are out there, um, you know, saying and, and standing up for what, what they believe in and what I think is right. Well, and certainly, you know, it's, it's a movement started by Black Lives Matter, but we know that as people of color, it affects us all. And so, and especially in Minneapolis, um, there's, uh, quite, um, I think, a Native American presence there in, in the protest because of that reason. So, boy, we could talk forever, but our time is up. I just want to thank both of you for joining us. Dana Hedgepeth with the uh, Washington Post, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And uh, Julian Brave Noise Cat, writer extraordinaire. Thank you, Julian. Thanks so much for having me. And everyone, please have a safe weekend. Uh, join us again Monday. Take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Tolohungba. Thanks for joining us.
is Indian country today.